Hi everybody and welcome to the first Selkie Outreach webinar. I'm going to wait a few minutes until all attendees have a chance to, to join. So I'll wait a few minutes and then I'll just run through some um, general housekeeping for this webinar and I will continue on with an, an introduction and welcome and a brief overview of the Psyche project. I'll run through the speakers and then we can get on with the, the main event. I suppose I can start now. Um, we start with the general housekeeping. Um, we have the chat and the Q&A function. If we can keep the chat function for any technical issues, um, if there is an echo or if someone's video or feed starts to go, we can use that function and the Q&A then we keep for, for questions only. Now, uh, this survey, or sorry, this webinar came about as a result of a survey uh, that we did. Um, we surveyed up to 100 SMEs across the UK and Ireland, and um, they came back with some uh, subjects that they were most interested in. And one of the topics that came up was this uh, local supply chain sustainability and how diversification and innovation um, is, is great for the business and the, uh, the, the local supply chain. Now this is a rapidly growing sector um, with political and financial backing and there are many opportunities in the marine renewable energy industry. Now today on the panel we have myself, uh, TJ Horgan, I'm the Psyche project manager based in Marae um, here in Cork. We have Jess Hooper, she is the program manager from Marine Energy Wales. Uh, she's going to give an overview of the marine energy sector in Wales. We have Sarah Levis, she is the Psyche work package tree supply chain engagement uh, work package. She is the work package leader there with one of our partners, Mentor Mon. And we have uh, Dr. Frank Crowley from UCC. Um, he will be giving the main presentation today on the um, innovation subject. Now, I am going to, I'm just going to begin. Okay, um, a first slide here, uh, our outreach webinar, it's to promote the, firstly promote this, the project and then garner more SME interest in the project and um, create more interest in SMEs to join the network. Uh, joining this cross-border innovation network, that supply chain access, business support, uh, the projects, uh, we're going to use our project funds for knowledge transfer, future webinars and events. And um, we are 
also today we have on minty.com a very short survey uh, so if all attendees could please go to that address and use the code 403970 and we only have around a dozen questions there and I can share the results at the end of the webinar. Now a word from our sponsors. Um, this project has received funding from the European Regional Development Fund, ERDF, through the Ireland Wales Cooperation Programme and is administered by WEFO. A brief introduction to the project. Um, six partners equally spread across Ireland and Wales and uh, the two main research institutions, uh, University College Cork and Swansea uh, UCC. We are the coordinator and uh, specialities Wave Energy Tech, Techno-Economics. Um, Swansea University is a lead partner, the title Technology and Sensors, GDG Ireland, that's Gavin and Doherty Geosolutions. They're the foundation and mooring specialist, DP Energy Ireland, project management, but they're also involved in three other work packages, PCF, Pembrokeshire Coastal Forum of Wales. Um, the group Marine Energy Wales is leading the dissemination and communication work package. And uh, Mintomon Wales, um, that is the public engagement and SME support. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention, um, speaking of Marine Energy Wales, we have Manon, Kanastan from Marine Energy Wales. She is our work package two dissemination and communication work package leader. Sorry, Manon. Also involved, uh, we have the Selkie Advisory Board. Um, we have a broad range of people here from uh, across the Triple Helix. Um, Peter Coyle, MRIA, John Breslin from Smart Bay, Helen Donovan, Welsh Government. Ian Masters and Alison Williams from Swansea, Liz Davies at uh, the Anglesey Council, Tim James, Port of Milford Haven, Michal Lyons, Cork City Council, Mary O'Leary Chase, Gordon Dalton and Jimmy Murphy from uh, UCC Marae and Eamon Curtin, UCC Ignite. That is the, that is the um, startup section of, of UCC. Now, due to time constraints, I'm just going to do a brief outline of two of the partners from Selkie uh, for, on this webinar, one Welsh, one Irish. So the Marine Energy Wales, um, what they have been doing so far um, is site visits with developers, supply chain company meetings. We had the first public information event in North Wales. Uh, we have plans for the future supply chain events in Ireland and Southwest Wales. It's going to be post-COVID. Uh, these webinars are a stopgap between now and the and the face-to-face -face events. Um, supply chain survey, webinar workshop series, and LinkedIn forums. Plus, we have close ties with other interreg European projects, such as Tiger. We're going to co-host an event with them. Uh, plus, numerous conferences. Uh, virtual conferences these days coming up. Now, a Selkie Industry Partner, um, an Irish company based here in Cork, DP Energy, renewable energy company operating worldwide to develop sustainable renewable energy projects. Um, they have onshore wind, offshore wind, ocean energy, solar PV and storage. Now this company, Ocean Energy, they are involved in Selkie as our wave tender pilot company, Irish and US based Ocean Energy specialized commercial company for developing wave energy technology. Uh, Professor Tony Lewis, Chief Technical Officer, has over 40 years work experience in the sector and has been involved in the development of the Ocean Energy Boy for the last 10 years and is a recognized global expert on marine renewables. This is their um, route of technology development. 
Stage one was the tank testing and improvements. It's back around 2013. Then we went on to a 1 to 15 scale model, um, tank testing numerous places, including Smart Bay off the Galway coast, the west coast of Ireland. Stage three uh, was a 1 to 3 model. We tested a different PTO, power takeoff systems. And finally, the full scale model, which is now built and is going to be part of the Psyche project and help validate our tools. Our first tool project we'll be developing is the GIS, the Geographical Information System and the Techno-Economic Model, um, specifically designed for Irish and Welsh wave and tidal enterprises and developers. We're going to propose sites and produce techno-economic recommendations for Irish and Welsh technologies. The GIS aspect will allow for identification of potential sites, techno-economic element will assess project feasibility at these sites. Um, both UCC and DP contributing to this work package and this tool will also link into the operations and maintenance logistic model, the foundation and mooring tools and will act as the data repository. The second tool is we are going to develop um, with Gavin and Doherty Geo Solutions, a foundation and more in commercial software for use in this region. Two uh, particular tools, um, drag embedment anchor, design tool for floating systems and a gravity based fixed foundation tools for bottom fixed devices. Really what we need is a methodology that will produce a safe design at the lowest cost. And um, we are gonna validate both these tools and the pilot projects and they can subsequently be used for the general industry. Now, all Psyche tools are going to be open source post project. Third tool are physical and numerical modeling of wave and tidal devices and arrays. Now this work package um, it's split between Marai, UCC and Swansea. Uh, we're going to do the modeling and tank testing just to further advance the sector as a whole. As you can see here some modeling from a single rotor device. These are our going to be data inputs and model outputs from the, uh, the CFD modeling. Well, I'm not going to pretend I know what, what I'm speaking about. With these simulations take time and they need a lot of computing power. Um, we can see some graphs here from uh, weight behavior turbulence intensity. These are the uh, validation uh, programming on a three turbine array up to a larger array in the 14 turbines. And you can see from this modeling, um, they have a results um, between the regular, between the regular formation. And after the modeling, they discovered if they move the row or move row three back towards row four, it improves performance for both rows. Every little helps. Our next set of tools um, are the Selkie sensor tools. This is the first of three. Now, we're gonna build a converging beam ADCP. We're aiming for a unique niche. Um, this, this device will be small and portable and it has a good basis for uh, a commercial converging beam. Um, and it's gonna be uh, overcome a gap in the measurement capability. Second uh, uh, sensor tool, we're gonna use drones to measure surface currents uh, for tidal sites. Now these drones are easily deployable, low cost alternative two boys and we are getting very good results so far. Now our third tool from this work package on sensors is a new type of data logger. Uh, this is work package seven. Now we're going to build on devices designed, tested and deployed as part of the Softech project. Um, uh, the system is doing well and it has so far survived Scottish and Canadian winter weather with no observable problems.
Now, this is uh, the DP energy input into uh, the Psyche project work packages. For the work package four, the GIS and TE tool, um, they're going to give real industry input into tool functionality, required outputs, guidance, and data for detailed yield analysis. Uh, the work package six, which is the um, physical and numerical modeling, we're going to give site data to validate performance and a combination of ADCP and CFD model data to help uh, validate our tools. And the work package eight, which is the operations and maintenance, we are going to have real um, recent experience and a demonstration of efficient supply chain and the deployment installation and operating lessons for project other project developers. Now the O&M software that the Psyche is going to uh, develop, we had a joint tender uh, worth upwards of 100k with a separate project and the successful bidder was Ocean Tech. It's an Irish software development company specialized in providing high level technical software expertise to support clients. They're experienced in software development for the research as well as marine sectors. I'd just like to say that, uh, reiterate that all the Psyche tools, um, they are going to be open source post projects. Uh, full training will be given in the tools. And um, as one of the project outputs, um, every supported SME would be entitled to 12 hours of, of, of training and um, interaction with the project and its staff. Now, next up after me, is uh, Frank Crowley, um, lecturer in the School of Economics, UCC. He's published uh, research articles on the topics of innovation, enterprise growth and development, management practices, regional development and policy, and he is also the core director at the Spatial and Regional Economics Research Centre. Oh, I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, Frank, um, if, if there's no, no questions, I, I will pass over to you. Okay, can you see that, uh, TJ? Yeah. My slides, so it should be my first slide, yeah. Okay, thanks, Frank. Uh, yeah, so is my presentation up, it is? Yes. Okay, all right. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, so it was good to get kind of more of an insight into the development um, of the Silky project from TJ. Um, what I would like to go through today is um, kind of thinking about the innovation aspect of the industry, um, not maybe particularly related to the marine energy, but just innovation in general, um, and uh, basically what determines innovation outcomes of firms. Um, so what factors are, are, are most important? Is it the firm or the region? And I think, you know, in terms of answering that, um, clearly it's both. Um, and I suppose it even goes beyond the region. It goes even more international than, than the local region that the firm might be operating in. Um, I suppose what's important as well for the Silky participants and, and people that are, are engaging with this uh, webinar today is that we are looking to investigate this um, more over the next 12 months um, where we'll be going into um, significant data collection and interview process to uh, get a better understanding around this because that will now allow us to enable uh, the appropriate interventions and to um, advise policy in the future around this whole area. Um, so I suppose first of all is, is to get kind of our heads around this idea of innovation. We see the, the concept is thrown out quite a lot um, in a general way. Um, and I suppose in the discipline of economics, it's, it's quite specific. Um, first of all, the entrepreneur is, is, is critical to innovation. 
um, and the act of entrepreneurship. Um, and secondly, um, really, innovation is about the commercialization of an idea. And that, that word commercialization is extremely important. Um, so ideas are everywhere. You know, you have an awful lot of patents, a lot, a lot of technological developments happening in R&D level. But can we, can we get it to the market? Is there going to be a market for it? Um, and that's when we term it as innovation, is when there is an actual market for um, an idea. And I suppose, you know, we go back as far as Schumpeter in 1934, he was kind of the father of innovation. And, um, you know, he's, he outlined a number of five key elements um, around the types of in innovation that are there. Um, broadly, you can summarize this into two types. One is product innovation and the other is process innovation. So, uh, or product or service innovation. And the second one then could be technological methods of production, or it could be non-technological. You know, um, if we think about the, the company Ryanair, um, you know, okay, they're a market leader, they're going through obviously a very difficult time at the moment with COVID-19, but how did they get their comparative advantage over their competitors? Um, it really wasn't very much technologically based. It was non-technological um, in a lot of cases and organizational innovations. Also how they actually organized their business. They found it added value and were able to pass this on to the customer. So there's two broad ones, product and, and process. And I suppose the key thing about innovation is that, it's commercial, that you can um, make it commercial. Um, okay, so what I'd like to introduce to you is just kind of um, ways of thinking about the innovation process from the perspective of the firm um, and just kind of introducing an apparatus of thought. Like, how do we think about this? And um, in general, when we approach these issues, we don't think about them. Uh, there isn't a specific model for a specific sector. Um, generally, what you have is a number of principles that relate to any type of sector and once you start to investigate it, you'll identify that certain factors are more important for certain sectors. Um, and that is likely what we are going to find within the marine energy as well. Um, and what this framework here that we have um, from Roper et al is a commonly employed one, which is the innovation known as the innovation value chain. Um, and there's three steps to innovation value chain. The first one is knowledge sourcing, um, which is in, if we go from left to right within the diagram, and we move it on then to knowledge transformation. And knowledge transformation is therefore basically we have we've transformed an idea into an actual product um, or a process. It's resulting in cost savings or it introduces a new want or need for the market, uh, for the customer. And then from that innovation, you the firm goes on to exploit it. So they either have sales growth, um, they either export it, um, they make a profit or value added. So these are the three general stages. Um, and I suppose in terms of thinking about the marine energy at the moment, really um, the whole, that the industry is very much focused in this idea around knowledge sourcing and knowledge transformation. So this first box is a, is, is a critical element to it. Not only are the firms engaging in internal, internal R&D, but they're also engaging with um, suppliers, which are known as backward linkages, competitors, which are known as horizontal linkages. Um, and then obviously public knowledge linkages are extremely important in the early stages um, of the innovation process. Um, you know, basically it, it can go back to the types of knowledge that are, are, are required at different stages of, of, of the product um, or service. Um, and at, that st at the stage in the knowledge sourcing stage where you have a high degree of analytical knowledge that is needed. What I mean by that analytical knowledge is know why. We need to know why about certain things. Um, you'd have a lot of linkages normally with universities. Um, and so that generally tends to happen around the knowledge sourcing um, stage. So once you get an idea um, and you, can, you believe it's commercialized, you might get a patent for it. Um, you start to prototype it, you start to introduce it to the market, you're then transforming this knowledge. So, but innovation is not an end in itself. Okay, it might have be commercialized, but can you exploit it? Can you use it for, for, for gain for the firm, which is to um, maybe create a profit or to grow the firm, etc. cetera. Um, so in that sense, innovation is an end in itself. You're looking to actually exploit it and move it on. 
But critically, you'll see that the, the firm is engaging in knowledge sourcing. They are the actors within the firm that are sourcing knowledge from their competitors, from universities, from customers, from suppliers uh, along the supply chain. Um, so they are the key agent as the entrepreneur. And critical to that is obviously their, what we call absorptive capacity, their ability to identify information that is actually happening outside the firm. So this is all that is external. And that's why the role of place becomes critical for the firm because they're actually sourcing all, a lot of the knowledge from outside. It's not just an internal base type of thing. Um, and all these other things are, are, are affected by the resource-based factors of the firm. How's, what's the size of it? Um, how long have they been around? Um, what's their experience maybe in other markets? Have they diversified from other sectors into this sector, um, et cetera? Is it low tech company, is it a high tech company? So the innovation value chain is, is a good kind of starting point to start thinking about the innovation process. And I suppose if you're an actor within a firm, you might, it, it is probably a good thing to start thinking about, well, you know, who am I interacting with? Who am I networking with? Who are most important? Maybe there's unexploited opportunities within my uh, knowledge sourcing arsenal, so to speak, that, we, that, that, that you could exploit um, and that would be worth maybe pursuing. Um, so that's the innovation value chain. But in some ways, that's a very simplified version in the sense that, look, the firm engages in knowledge sourcing, then it come up, comes up with a product or a service, and then it just exploits it. It's much, much more complicated than that. And Klein and Rosenberg uh, introduced an interesting model. Um, it goes back as far as 1986 now. Um, but they you know, identified again the importance of external knowledge for the firm and the importance which might be found within the region or internationally. And if we go back to that idea around analytical knowledge, the knowing why about things, ac academic work and universities probably global, glo globally will feed into a particular industry that might be located in North Wales um, or um, in the south of Ireland, for instance. So um, basically the chain link model kind of goes again through the steps, the steps involved from left to right again, that there's, you know, the firm has identified a potential market, um, the inventor, they produce the analytical design, they come up with a prototype, maybe the detailed design and test, and they start to redesign and produce it. And then they try to get into distributed market. And, you know, again, it's this kind of idea, oh, it's like a seamless linear process. And the reality about the innovation process is that it's nothing like that. Um, and that's what Klein and Rosenberg were trying to get at, is that, you know, you identify maybe a potential market, you're coming up with an invention of um, a particular technology, and then it starts to all fall apart. Um, you know, it's so complicated. And again, it goes back to the complexity of knowledge here. And do you actually have to tap into external sources for knowledge? Can you do this? In Internally, you might be able to do by investing in R&D, getting the right expertise within the company. Um, but uh, a lot of the time, you're, it's likely that you're going to need the system, the innovation system that is around you within the region or internationally. So you're going to have to tap into the research institutions here and the existing stock of knowledge. Um, now, one of the critical elements um, that is missing from this diagram of course, is you might be thinking is finance. How do you do any of this? Um, and it's very important that, I suppose, in terms of the marine energy sector, finance is a critical issue because you've got so many market failures. There's so many reasons for why it can't be commercialized at the moment. Um, so this could be technology problems. It could be market-driven problems. You know, the relative competition field um, in the energy supply might be unequal. Um, so there's a, a number of reasons as to why you might have financial implications and of course subsidies might be critically important if you can't get it from um, traditional sources like banks and of course you might go through the first stages of this innovation pro process within the chain link model and then identify the detailed design and test or even re re redesigning and producing that there's something wrong with the technology what you thought you had wasn't what customers wanted or didn't do the, the job um, the way you had uh, thought it would do or um, for, foreseen. And then you have to go back again to the existing stock of knowledge and reinvent it. And again, you might need additional finance. So 
critical throughout the innovation pro process is due to the uncertainty of the knowledge that is involved, particularly if you're dealing with very high tech products, um, is this ability to be able to get finance. Um, okay, so like what we can see from these two models is obviously the, the firm itself is extremely important in controlling the levers to the innovation process. And I know I'm giving a very quick oversight here. Normally I'd spend about an hour on these types of models. But um, what we see is the importance of the external environment. And if we start to look at the world, it's extremely spiky in terms of population. It's extremely spiky in terms of where patents happen. And that means that there must be local comparative advantages happening. Um, and basically what is driving a lot of this is the importance of clusters. Um, and what are they? And I suppose it's one of the key role of Silky as well is to develop a cluster in the marine energy. Um, and basically industrial clustering occurs as a result of relative advantage that is created by the industry itself, right? So the industry players, the firms within it, their ability to network with one another, the ability to source knowledge from one another, the ability to have high quality um, research environments around them like high quality universities and uh, well-informed uh, local government or national government sources. Uh, is extremely important within this process of industrial clustering um, and for the ability for the industry within a local area to create um, a, a relative advantage. So like why do particular regions create and attract certain global industries is a question, an economic question of our time that we are particularly interested in and that is different for different um, uh, sectors and there will be different sources that are important. I suppose obvious clusters that come, come to mind would be you know, Silicon Valley or the financial sector in London or the fashion uh, industry in the north Italy. Um, but these clusters seem to, you know, spontaneously in some ways, they're, they're um, an outcome of entrepreneurial action, not of design a lot of the time. Uh, but what we are finding is that there is more an element of design that is important as the technologies become, um, as products and services become more high tech um, and the firms become more high tech. So clusters are the concentration of economic activities in groups of related industries in a specific location that are connected through multiple linkages and spillovers. Basically what you have is an awful lot of firms um, that, are, are in, that are specializing in the same area that are also in competition with one another, that are generally located in close proximity. Um, and the related industries matter. So the supply chain, the value chain, to be able to get economies of scope and to learn from one another, the needs and wants of one another um, as entrepreneurial actors. Um, and a lot of the time we see, you know, you can pick out Silicon Valley, an awful lot of high tech companies in one particular area. Can we get clusters of the marine energy in certain locations as well where location will matter? Um, and obviously collaboration um, is an element of these clusters that is becoming more critical. Now, the reality is that most of these clusters, as I said, are not creative, but governments can have a significant influence on their emergence and growth. And that is by solving system failures. So particularly we see an awful lot of financial uh, system failures around green technologies, for instance, and within the green industry. Um, and so government has a critical role if they are going to be able to unlock and, and exploit the opportunities within that particular area. So clusters reflect specializations in groups of related industries, not just one narrow activity. And I suppose cluster gives this heightened importance to the role of place, to the role of the environment in which firms are operating it, and how they are exploiting the knowledge that is created in that environment. Um, so the presence of clusters also shapes locations, opportunities for structural change, which is a key priority actually underlying the European Smart Specialization Project. So very recently, the Smart Specialization Project at European level have identified clusters as be a critical way of harnessing growth for the future. Um, now, you know, a lot of the, I suppose, when you're thinking about marine energy, you're thinking of something that's very high tech, complicated, a lot of complex knowledge, a lot of academic input to solve the analytical knowledge problems. Um, but, you know, clusters can also be very low tech um, in the sense that one such cluster that has, has become well known 
probably going through a very difficult time quite recently is is the Motor Valley cluster um, in Bologna, around Bologna in, um, in in Italy. And Motor Valley basically is generally known as it is a tourism cluster. Um, and what their comparative advantage that they identified is the comparative advantage that this particular industry had was its heritage, right? Its heritage in the specialization um, in the automation industry. And people were particularly interested in this from a tourist perspective. Um, you, know, you know, people had um, uh, significant interest in going to museums, etc. And all uh, and visiting um, associated supply chains that were involved within the, um, the, the history of, of, of the cluster. And so it's not really the, the, the motor industry cluster that Italy is now tapping into and exploiting. It, you know, that we're going back up 1800 years when that happened, but now they're exploiting the tourism aspect of that, um, and which has been a, quite significant for them um, over the past decade. Um, but critical to unlocking the motor valley, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, I just want to give a, a number of examples. But you can see all the actors that are involved in terms of creating a cluster, a successful customer, cluster. First of all, you have a key anchor at the very top of this diagram, which is the government. At the very bottom, you have educational institutions, training, training schools, research programs, etc., that provide the skills that the industry requires. Um, and then you also have key elements within that. So suppliers, the media, firms, Motor Valley initiatives, all har being harnessed off this comparative advantage of an industrial heritage that has been created by that industry over time. Um, and so they're tapping within in, into that. So that's kind of like the you know, you can see that all the linkages that happen within a cluster um, that are extremely important. And a good way of thinking about, I suppose, clusters is Porter's model. I'm not sure whether many of you have come across this before, but um, it, it's known as the diamond model. Um, and it's a good way of thinking about the strategic economic model. Why do particular regions create, attract certain global industry. So whether they create global industries in the first place or why do they attract them? Um, now the attract part is normally after. Um, but you can see here that you know there's key four key critical factors that are kind of all linked in together. Um, first of all that they have unique factor conditions. So if you think of the marine uh, energy industry, you know one of the key factor conditions here is obviously being located um, near um, you know, um, good um, tidal um, opportunities and, 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 and being close to the water. Um, obviously, factor conditions that might be extremely important is having the skills um, within a particular location as well. So these are the unique comparative advantages that a location might have. Um, and these could be institutional as well. Like, so they, for instance, you know, do having things like a silky project matter? Do making certain local government interventions matter? Um, is there high expertise in local government or national government around a particular industry that allow it to unlock a potential? So you can see how all these factors interact with one another. So firm strategy, structure and rivalry, related and supported industries, and also having customers within that area. Generally, the ultimate um, condition that supports a lot of this is all these factors being in proximity with one another. Um, so geographical proximity, so an awful lot of competitors, uh, rivals competing with one another, also sharing knowledge. You get knowledge spillovers from one company to another company. You have a very strong supply chain that is related to these companies. And then you have the factor conditions that are extremely important. So, you know, do you have access to the, the tidal uh, properties that you require from the ocean or wherever, and then do you have customers? Um, is there actually a market for it? That's a key, key critical component of this thing. Is there going to be the demand conditions necessary for it? And then outside of this, you see chance is luck. Um, a lot of innovations are generated just through pure chance, through luck, spontaneously. And then Obviously, government have a role in, in, in creating the right environment for innovations to, to, to take off. Um, another thing, I suppose, what is critical and a model that has emerged quite recently within 
um, the innovation literature is this idea of a green innovation value chain. And I suppose this has been identified largely because of the difficulties in renewable energy and, 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 and green products. Um, and this is just a model from by Olson, which he refers to as the green innovation value chain. And what he discusses within this is the fusion prospects of green technologies through environmental and financial comparisons. So basically, what are going to be the environmental benefits to um, a particular technology? And, you know, is there going to be financial benefits? And we know that within this literature at the moment that there are a number of financial deficits that are being, being emerging around um, green technologies, you know, technology advancements, uh, deficits. Um, they need, a, you know, they need a lot of subsidies. Um, and you also have problems around changes in, 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 in market conditions. So falling oil prices, for instance, energy prices, which might have an impact on the incentives to try to come up with um, renewable energy sources. So the green innovation value chain, which I won't go through in detail, just introduce it today, is something that has emerged quite recently just to be um, more applicable to um, the renewable energy uh, area. Um, and I suppose it's, it's, it's important, I suppose, also from to, to, to start using models like that so we can investigate and uh, assess um, the potential of particular technologies uh, you know, because I suppose this is difficult when you have uh, pro-green attitudes within consumer, from consumers, but, you know, do we have pro-green behaviours? A lot of time we don't. These, these, these are misaligned. Um, and then just to, just to finish off, um, you know, I talked quite a bit about um, clusters and their competencies and importance for unlocking um, innovation, innovative sectors. Um, we can see that some of the development here in terms of um, from marine energy Wales, some of the developments quite recently. So 16 marine energy developers, four test sites, two new alliances. Um, you get early mover advantage in wave and tidal stream export market worth up to 76 million. Um, so far, 124 million invested in Wales. So what you're trying to get here is the factor conditions. Um, the factor conditions seem to be right uh, for these particular locations um, can they have the can, can we overcome the financial deficits that are required we can see that there's a lot of money being invested and see a lot of companies that are diversifying diversifying into this particular industry at the moment there's two examples here on the right hand side fawn trackway and mainstay marine solutions so like fawn trackway for instance they specialize in portable roads um, and landing mats for armed forces and i think um, one of the uh, people involved in Fawn Trackway are on the call today. And um, they are working with orbital marine power, um, creating four steel anchor structures and bespoke mooring connectors for the first O2 machine. Um, and also Mainstay Marine Solutions, they were originally a boat fabrication company and they built in fabrication of a number of innovative prototype projects within this area as well. So we can see that there's a no, number of companies diversifying within to the marine energy industry. Um, and, you know, we're going to, it's likely that we're going to see more of that, um, where the comp competencies of particular industries are quite aligned. Um, and so some interesting developments um, around the marine energy in Wales. So that concludes my presentation for today. I uh, hope you've enjoyed it. I know it's kind of a quick snapshot of the innovation process. Um, and I hope to go into a little more detail uh, in the future. Um, and particularly when we actually go out and collect data uh, that is unique to this particular industry um, and uh, more qualitative uh, interviews as well. Um, so thank you. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the webinar. Thanks, Frank. Thanks for that. Um, great overview of the um, innovation process, the innovation system. Um, there was just a few points uh, I'd like to mention. Um, you mentioned the tap into the research institute research institutions existing stock of knowledge. I think on the Psyche project, we have UCC and Swansea University. 
um, between the two of us, we would have a lot of um, a lot of expertise. Now, another thing you mentioned was the cluster. Now, there is a marine renewable energy cluster in uh, Pembrokeshire. Um, some of those are involved with Selkie. Now, joining the Selkie network um, it can be a good opportunity to exploit that knowledge um, and possibly become in some uh, matchmaking. We'll try and get everyone some work uh, out of this project. Now, you mentioned a demand. Is there going to be a demand for product? Now, these will be wave energy converters and tidal energy converters. And I think the demand for power, especially clean power, uh, with uh, the European carbon goals, that, that demand is, is only going to grow over the coming years especially if uh, Europe are to be carbon neutral by, by 2050. Um, also, uh, the Selkie will have its main survey, uh, which will be coming out. This will be the Work Package 9 um, business and uh, development survey. Okay, um, also, if I could just remind participants to go to minty.com and do the, uh, do the short survey for us, please. Now, next up is Jess Hooper. Um, Jess is going to give an overview of the marine energy sector in Wales, cross-border collaboration and opportunities for supply chain diversification. Uh, thank you very much, TJ. I'll just check. Can you see my slide and can you hear me okay? I can see your slide and hear you fine. Perfect. Okay, uh, hello everybody. Um, so as TJ said, I'm Jess Hooper. I'm the Marine Energy Wales Programme Manager. Um, and I'm going to look, hopefully present to you um, about the marine energy sector in Wales, the progress we've made to date. Um, I think uh, Frank did touch on some of it. I'm hopefully going to go into a little bit more depth there just to explore a little bit more about the projects um, and some of our cross-border collaboration activities that we're, we're doing at present as an organisation and the projects that we're involved with and hopefully um, for some of you uh, listening where you can get involved and how you go about um, getting involved to get the help to, to diversify your own businesses. So Marine Energy Wales is a membership organisation um, and we, we provide support and guidance for the sector. We, we bring together technology developers, project developers, the supply chain, academia and the public sector um, looking to kind of build, build momentum around the sustainable marine energy generation opportunity um, in order to make that significant contribution to, the, to a low carbon economy. So we look at strategic opportunities for collaboration. Um, we, we tend to drive uh, networking events and, and seek to build those relationships and value chains that Frank has just mentioned as part of his presentation. Um, as an organization, we represent the sector at Welsh, UK and European level, um, aiming to raise the profile of the sector and its needs, not just regionally, but also nationally and internationally. We've recently, along those lines, just become involved in two clusters focused around decarbonisation and the opportunity the Celtic Sea poses for marine renewables. So there's lots of opportunities there for companies to engage and get involved um, and understand that sector. We essentially act as a strategic gateway into the sector network and are uniquely placed to promote Welsh capability, champion the Welsh opportunity and encourage those strategic and mutually beneficial relationships. Um, so as part of that, the MEW team is also actively working with specific projects in support of the sector. So Selkie, the host today, is one of those. Um, and MEW, Marine Energy Wales, is actually a partner in delivering that. Um, I think TJ introduced my, my colleague Manon earlier. Uh, so she's providing um, support for uh, communications and dissemination. So you'll probably hear from her a little bit more um, if you signed up to the newsletters. So What's driving the sector he, here in Wales? Um, as a nation, Wales has taken a number of key steps to building some of those foundations that Frank mentioned. Um, we're fortunately blessed with significant and diverse marine energy resources, including tidal range, 
tidal stream, wave and floating offshore wind. So that gives us that sound geographical basis that I think Frank was, was alluding to in his presentation there. Um, we also have a supportive government and proactive policies and activities um, that the government are driving to try and um, address some of those potential barriers. Um, in terms of policies, we have the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, um, which looks to pull together seven strands to building a, um, a sustainable society, essentially, that gives us jobs and economy and prospects, but also does that in a sustainable way that's resilient and, and not too detrimental to the environment. Um, that's a key, key kind of consideration. So having all of those things come together is very good from a marine renewable point of view because we do offer solutions to some of those problems. So we have a number of collaborative projects working to unite sectors and regions. I'm saying Selkie is obviously one of them, but we also participate with CCAMS, um, which is, I can never remember what it stands for, but there's two universities, uh, University of Bangor and Swansea University that have come together to deliver um, academic support um, to the marine renewables industry. Um, and then another key example would be that of the Celtic Sea Alliance, um, which actually pulls in um, representation from Ireland, Wales and the greatest southwest region of sort of Cornwall area looking at the opportunity from the Celtic Sea floating offshore wind um, potential. So also then within Wales we have energy industries that pre-exist. They have skilled and experienced workforce and the associated supply chain expertise um, in particular, you've got Anglesey that, that can talk about their nuclear experiences, but then also down on the south coast, you've got Milford Haven um, with its oil and gas infrastructure and Port Talbot as well. So there's a number of kind of those value chain bases there that, that, that Frank again touched on. Um, coupled with existing and developing infrastructure, so this is where I say the, the government's sort of helping us out. We, we have world-class ports um, already up and operational, but we've just seen the Swansea Bay City deal announced, which is a £60 million pound injection um, into the Milford Haven region, where we've got, um, I think it's the second deepest port in the world. So, you know, that injection of money enables us to improve that infrastructure to support this sector. We then also have grid access. So um, on the map there in the picture, you can see the yellow lines. Um, these are high voltage network lines that essentially give us the opportunity to take that power away from Wales and into, into the rest of the UK. Something that somewhere like Scotland struggles with, they're a little bit more isolated and their network isn't quite so strong. Um, and then we also have an offshore renewable energy catapult project, the Marine Energy Engineering Centre of Excellence, which brings you know, real technical expertise to the region um, and enables us to innovate um, using um, experienced and well qualified and kind of well connected networks through the catapult. So ultimately we're well on our way to becoming a centre of excellence for marine technology and enabling those cross industry linkages and economies of scope cross sector. Um, so Frank also mentioned this, but I'll go through it anyway. As of 2020, we have currently 16 marine energy developers actively progressing projects across Wales. We have array demonstration zones for both wave and tidal technology. More lives in North Wales and Pembrokeshire demonstration zone in south in the south. Um, more lives I know is looking to become part of the um, North Wales growth deal and then obviously I mentioned the Swansea Bay City deal which are kind of injecting money into these regions in order to facilitate the development of this industry. We also have seabed agreements in place for over 500 megawatts of marine energy sites and further sites totaling almost 3.5 gigawatts have been identified in respect of wave and tidal with floating offshore wind representing potentially 50 gigawatts and the significant crossover between those sectors and the sort of supply chain opportunity that we see it isn't just to necessarily one of those particular types. There could be multiple um, uses of the technology that we see come through um, the innovation and the innovation challenges that are put forward. Um, so this map here shows just the, the number of projects that we've got ongoing um, and, and where those clusters of, of activity are. As you can see, there's the northwest of Wales up in Anglesey and then um, quite a bit of activity down in the southwest and along the south coast as well. But it's crucial to recognise that the potential scale of these projects is unprecedented, particularly when you talk about floating offshore wind. And no single location nor supply chain player is likely to have the capacity to handle the entirety of the demand there. So coordinated regional collaboration is, is going to be very important. 
Strategic collaboration strives to increase the awareness of the Celtic Sea opportunity, for example, highlighting the benefits of regional cooperation and facilitating mutually beneficial participation in projects in the Celtic Sea. Um, so the Celtic arrangement also brings the nations of Wales and Ireland and the Great Southwest region together to identify potential barriers. So those, those obstructions that potentially government can help to, to, to drop and, and find solutions for overcoming them to the benefit of these regions that we talk about here. Um, so there's, there's a need for a delivery of practical solutions and engagement activities. And you know, as MEW, we're working to increase business competitiveness support greater innovation, attract new entrants and grow existing companies in the delivery of the marine renewable energy opportunity and projects such as Selkie really work to facilitate those objectives. So just in terms of the, the sort of um, sector benefits that we've already seen in the supply chain in Wales from um, the projects that um, Frank touched on, of the companies who've built or are currently building devices in Wales, our research indicates that at least 50% of their supply chain has come from within Wales to date. Companies currently with projects under development have similar aspirations for 50% content, and that's a minimum, so some of them are achieving much more than that. Supply chain companies across the country are actively engaging in the sector with specific work packages for further engage engagement planned within the Selkie work program and, and MEW's work stream as well, seeking to promote the awareness and diversification opportunities that we have cross sector. Strategic collaboration and increasing sector awareness is leading to supply chain clusters forming around project development areas in both North and South West Wales. So hopefully some of those um, ideas that, that Frank has kind of outlined there We've got the foundations for those and we can continue to build on them. The industry is well poised to transfer these skills and workforce from the oil and gas, automotive, aerospace industries. And we can offer resilient prospects for companies facing challenges as a result of COVID-19 and Brexit. And um, I'll hand over now to Sarah to run through the mechanisms and opportunities that you have to engage with the sector and how to get involved through the Selkie project. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jess. No problem, TJ. Thanks, Jess. Um, I know we're short on time, but um, you had a great presentation, some great slides. Um, the sector, the oil and the whale sector has some great resources um, and the potential and opportunities for, the, for diversification um, are, are, are manifold. Um, you mentioned uh, other projects such as the Celtic Sea Alliance, um, we have the capability, the capacity, and the companies to, to progress this, this industry really quickly. Okay, um, final speaker for today, uh, Sarah Levitt. She is the Psyche Work Package 3 um, SME Support and Engagement Officer from um, Mittermann. And she is going to give information on how to join the Psyche Network and plans for future supply chain events. Okay, thanks TJ. Yep, as, as everybody said, um, I'm working on WIP Package 2 for Selkie, um, which is knowledge transfer. And that means that I'm dealing with business engagement and the supply chain, and I'm based at Mentamon in Anglesey. Um, so, um, so whether you're part of the marine renewable sector already or not, join our network. Um, it's a free innovation network to help you build contacts across the Irish Sea, to learn about the sector and to gain knowledge and support and grab these opportunities that are arising. We are planning um, further webinars, so we're hoping to do one every month for the next few months. And we're also planning for face-to-face -face events for next year, hopefully when things calm down a little bit. So, hmm, don't know what's going on. There we go. Ah, technical difficulties. Sorry, guys. There we go. <laughs> so, to give a little bit of background as to how rapidly this sector is growing, in June, as um, Jess just said, there was a £60 million 
development announced for Pembroke Dock and Milford Haven um, to develop a marine energy hub down there. And this is expected to bring 1800 jobs to the area across the next 15 years. Um, as has already mentioned, we've also got a modelised project up in Anglesey in North Wales, and this has the opportunity to bring significant socioeconomic benefits to the region as well. Um, we had the latest Welsh National Marine Plan published in November of 2019, and um, that showed um, sorry, that showed significant support for the growth of renewables. Um, we've also got big support from the Irish government. Um, so as published in their research priority areas for 2018 to 2023, they emphasise their support for the growth of the renewable sector. Uh, and we've got marine energy hubs developing in Cork, Galway and Strangford Lough in Northern Ireland. So there are opportunities arising for supply chain work in Ireland as well. Um, and one of the main aims of Selkie is to develop these networks and expose businesses to these opportunities through collaborations across the Irish Sea. So here are a few of um, the companies that have already signed up to Selkie. Thank you. <laughs> uh, joining the marine renewable sector is certainly paying off for some of them, uh, especially those who've diversified into the sector. And we've already talked about uh, Fawn Trackway, who are based in North Wales and came from a background in defence, and Mainstay Marine, who are based in Pembrokeshire, who came from boat building. But think outside of the engineering box. If you are a company in insurance, recruitment, cleaning, you can diversify into this sector as well. So, to join our network, um, get in contact, email me at the address on screen and I will send you sign up forms. You can also join our mailing list from our website and you can follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn as well. And feel free to pose any questions on there, especially if we can't answer them now. Um, we will look to continue discussions on LinkedIn following this webinar. Thank you. Okay, thanks Sarah. Uh, thank you very much for that. Okay, we're, we're on time. Um, what I would like to do now is just say thank you to all the panelists for uh, participating and presenting. And a uh, special thanks to Frank Crowley as well, for coming on from the Cork University Business School and Jess Hooper, also from MEW, thank you to both. Also, I'd like to say thanks to all the attendees who registered and um, attended, and I hope you enjoyed this first webinar. And as Sarah said, we plan to have, well, a webinar a month, if we can. And I'm, I'm going to have to up my game on my slides Right, one final piece is the Mintimeter uh, presentation. Okay, I'm just going to check and see how many participants, six participants only. Right, I'm going to share my screen and we'll run through the, um, the responses. Okay, of the six, um, we can see here three uh, from Ireland, two Wales, and one from Europe. See the majority um, is male. Now I asked this question to cover the project uh, cross-cutting themes and the um, other general themes from the um, res responsible in research and, and innovation.
No company names, GDG, Sutherlands and Assembly. Uh, they are involved in Selkie, Balancing Rocks, OLWG Limited, and Norwegian AB. That's Jan's um, Stollhammer's company, Pembrokeshire Council. Thank you very much for, for joining us. We have more attendees coming in, another two. Compass Informatics, that's great. Wales is in the lead. That's great because as Sarah said, for the Psyche Network, we're going to need everyone from divers, boat builders, um, shipping, developers, fabricators, welders, anyone and anyone who would be involved in the supply chain. Cable assemblies, everything like that will be in, um, in, the, in the Selkie network. What is your stakeholder group? No, I did this Mentimeter, I actually made a mistake. I didn't leave a gap for other um, as I did in a, a question further on. So for the next webinar, I'll, I'll remedy that. You're involved in the Psyche project for interested. That's good. Are you involved in the MRE sector? Three interested in coming in, two no, and nine, they are involved in the MRE sector already. Are you aware of potential marine energy supply chain opportunities? Yes and no. That's where the networking and the matchmaking should help um, a lot of companies. Have you or your company diversified or innovated into the MRE sector from one industry to another? Nine yes, two no, and three looking to do so. I diversified myself in, I, my background is in uh, shipping, uh, agriculture, wind farms, offshore. And I guess I diversified into the uh, project management and academia side of things last, last September. Are you planning or have you to set up any new jobs to support the sector? Possibly. That's actually a good result. Six yes and seven possibly. Um, the Selkie project also has internally um, set up up to 10 positions for postdocs, uh, research masters, research assistants, plus full-time staff uh, within the beneficiaries as well. Rate, government, gov rate current government policies to support innovation with initiatives and funding grant aid. Overall, people find that uh, the governments are quite supportive um, for supporting this, this sector. What area would your company benefit from help or assistance? The highest one here, training or knowledge transfer. Also what uh, the Psyche project would, would like to achieve. What we have to achieve really to, to satisfy our, our, our project outputs. Our identified available funds, tech product and development. All these, the, the Psyche network will be able to assist. Now here are some of the other options. In what other area the benefit from help or assistance, research and developing, understanding IT applications used by the industry, link into this Celtic Sea uh, cluster. What does the industry require for cable molding assemblies? What do they like this like? Does English require? Meet. Now, any panelists who would like to answer one of these um, can, can do so. 
must be repaid in the renewable sector. Yeah, the cable molding assemblies, I wouldn't have the, the technical details on that, but somewhere in the project would. Project delivery, the renewable sector. But the Marine Energy Wales, uh, Jess Hooper mentioned that um, there is some talent acquisition. If we can have a skills transfer from the oil and gas industry over into the renewable sector, um, that's always a, a possibility. Like good uh, project delivery experience is always valuable. I was just going to come in, TJ, on some of the questions that are coming up here. Um, I, I'm, I'm conscious that we're out of time at the moment, but I know from a kind of engagement point of view, um, if, if we can collate these and pull them together, there's, there's numerous answers that we can give and work through. And if companies are going to get in touch with, with Sarah or Manon and we work through these, we can certainly kind of look to bolster the understanding that's coming through from these. And there's definitely oil and gas crossover that, we can, that we're looking to take advantage of, as I, as I referenced in my presentation. Um, in terms of cable connections, there's, there's numerous work going on. Um, one thing I would just reference in, in terms of the cluster down in Pembrokeshire, I touched on the Marine Energy Engineering Centre of Excellence. Um, if there's sort of innovative solutions that are out there, um, I, I know that Selkie and, and Mies are looking to work together to see whether Mies can support businesses in exploring those innovations. And if we can do those link ups through these projects, I think that would be a really good opportunity. Um, and I think the subsequent webinars that we're intending to do, um, both at Selkie, but at Marine Energy Wales actually has, has some as well, will explore some of these issues and potentially give more, more detail. So I'd strongly suggest signing up to the, the newsletters. Um, Marine Energy Wales has one, I know, and I think Selkie is in the process of setting one up um, and, and sort of going in through the website. Hope that's helpful. Thanks, Jess. Yeah, you're right, like all these um, subjects, um, we, we are hoping to address all, all of these um, over the scope of the project and through our, our partners. Now, the six pillars are of responsible research and innovation, sustainability and open access. It's like um, we have the most votes. Okay, that's it. I'm just go back to what I do is I'll just run back to the questions. We're up to almost 20 participants now. Identification of supply chain opportunities. That's a good one. Yeah, training and knowledge transfer. Fantastic. Yeah, there's quite um quite a good few issues there and join the Selkie network. And that is one of our one of our main aims is the is the knowledge transfer. The policies to support um, innovation. Seems to be above fifty percent, so that's that's the pass. New jobs. That's that's for the Selkie project. Uh, we have an output for a certain amount of uh, full time equivalent positions, and if we can help any company achieve that, then uh, that would be great. Quite a lot of diversification already. Are you aware of potential opportunities? Yes. Fantastic. And if you're not, then hopefully we can we can find some for you. Four interested in coming into the MRE sector. That's great. 
interested in joining the Psyche Network, that's great as well. Supply chain for marine renewable energy, six participants, fantastic. What else have we got here now? Default track rate, thanks Garrett. This Neptune radar, HIDAC, Geoscience Ireland business cluster. Very happy to have you on board. So I'm conscious of time, probably spent too much time here. Um, the gender balance, male, female, we're not too bad. What's your country most from uh, Wales at the moment? Hopefully next webinar we can have the Irish contingent um, back up there. Okay, that's it from me. Any questions? I don't see anything in the Q&A. Uh, just some in the chat. Okay, John McDonald's uh, consultant. Thanks, Jan. No problem. Okay. All right. I'm going to call it a day. Uh, thanks very much for your attending. Um, those results of the survey were interesting. Lost track of the time again. So thanks very much to everyone for attending, and uh, we hope we catch you next time. Thank you, Noah, and goodbye.